test. So who has sound on the video? Do you have a video? All right. I'm just going to close the session there. Tu veux refaire la modération ou pas Tu veux refaire la modération <laughs> Round 2 <two. laughs> Alright, everyone. <clears throat> so, ladies and gentlemen, we're, going to we're about to start the session. So, my name is Wayne Rocknedin. I'm working with UNDP and I'm very pleased to welcome you today for this session on climate and energy. Make sure that you are, in, you are in the right room. There was a slight uh, modification from the agenda. So this is climate today. So uh, briefly, I just want to say a quick word about the growth stage in Pack Venture. So this is the selection process that we start this year with our partners EPFL, SAP, and Orange. Uh, it's a rigorous selection process that we, um, with the aim to select growth stage in Pack Venture that work on SDG solution in developing country only. Uh, we received more than 120 nominations from uh, investment fund, uh, um, um, sorry, venture philanthropy, family office, and UN organization. And the entrepreneurs you're about to see today are the crème de la crème, the, the top finalists. So to moderate the session, I'm very pleased to welcome on stage uh, Loïc. Loïc is investment director at NG Rassembleur en Energy. And uh, please welcome him and enjoy the session. Thank you, Walid. Um, so I'm very happy and honored to be here today to present uh, the session with four different social entrepreneurs active all around the world uh, and that are fully dedicated to tackling major issues ranging from uh, energy access and, um, and gender and, and women empowerment to sustainable mobility through agricultural optimization and waste to energy. I'm lucky enough to already to know two of these, but I'm dying to hear more about the others. Ajayta, the floor is yours to explain how you got to address energy needs with adapted solutions, but also to create such an impressive platform in India. Is this okay? Can you hear me when I use this one? Okay, because then I won't use this. Thank you. 700 million people living in rural India want better opportunities, but they're stuck in poverty cycles due to the lack of access of reliable electricity, internet, financial services, and women are at the center of that burden. We changed that. I'm here today to discuss how Frontier Markets acts as a gateway to reach rural families in India through clean energy, finance, technology, and women businesses, building a platform of trust and inspiring rural households to demand and adopt further services for wealth opportunities. Meet Radha. Radha has been living in her village all her life. She's a part of a farming community. She was married at the age of 14 and a mother at 15. As a teenager, she was constantly worried about her children's safety, inhaling fossil fuels, and dealing with the uncertainty of electricity access. By 30, Radha was a mother of five, and she was fed up. She wanted the power to change her life and for her children. So she joined a bunch of NGOs, she learned training on skills, and she even accessed government programs. But she still wasn't happy, because Radha wanted access to wealth opportunities, and she knew she deserved an easier life. In fact, 700 million people living in rural India want access to wealth opportunities to drive change, half of which are women. The first core challenge is a lack of access. 
While infrastructure has improved, the majority of people are not getting access to quality goods and services in their villages. The second challenge is a lack of opportunity for rural women. They are not getting access to digital tools or market-based positions to enhance their income. What they want is consistent and sustained income to contribute to their family and have a seat on the table for decision making. Frontier Markets believes in consumer partnerships to drive change in rural communities. We've addressed these challenges with three specific solutions. First, a partnership with rural households, treating them as dignified customers in the deepest villages of India, building a platform for trust. The second is a robust technology and last mile supply chain platform to monitor and manage ongoing services to the last mile. And lastly, a strong women network of entrepreneurs called Saro Jeevan Sahilis, who are committed to creating an easier life, driving services in their villages. We invest in women to become uh, service providers in their villages. What we do is we work with local NGOs who have been building community relationships and creating women's self-help groups or women's networks. We recruit women from those networks and train them in sales, marketing, after sales service, data collection, and technical repair with digital skills to become our entrepreneurs. We then invest in their business. We lease them demo kits of solar lighting systems, home appliances, and a smartphone with internet connectivity. These Sahelis then use those toolkits to then connect with their neighbors and help them have physical experiences on these solutions. And then they facilitate sales through either cash or access to finance. Once they, once they place an order, Frontier Markets then has its own delivery solution where we have our own service center and our field staff that are delivering products on the very same day, doing monitoring on after sales service and have a call center to be directly con uh, connecting with the consumers, ensuring that the Sahelis can respond to her customers fast. The solutions that we've worked with are actually locally made by Indian companies where they are high quality, vetted by us, designed by us, that are in lighting, power, and appliances. And unlike the typical sales agent model, our women are earning both fixed income as well as variables on sales and service for facilitation of cash management or after sales service repair. All of this is facilitated through an e-commerce platform designed for women Sahilis. This is an all-in-one platform providing real-time support for distribution management, credit assessments, and transactions. Sahelis use the app for data collection of their customers, tracking cash collection, processing orders and collecting product feedback to coordinate service and hear the voices of their consumers. She's now become the trusted service provider in her village and literally everyone comes to her and gives their opinions about what they want. 2,500 settled Jeevan Sahelis have earned over $2.5 million of income, which has been invested in clean energy adoption, private education, healthcare, and stopping child marriages. Customers who, purchase our, uh, customers who purchase from our Sahelis are now coming back to us, and they're actually telling others. We've seen 20% repeat customer rates and 79% of our customers recommending the product to four or more people with an opportunity to capture that. With the growing commercial success of our model, we are also creating meaningful impact in the communities. Half a million people have purchased over 700,000 plus solutions in clean energy, impacting 3.5 million people and reducing over 1.5 million carbon tons proving that this approach is a holistic way of showing gender equality, economic empowerment, energy access, and reducing inequalities to the last mile. A bit about me. So I moved to India after college in 2005, where I started working in microfinance. So I worked in microfinance for seven years, living and working in over 5,000 villages across India. With one job only, how do you bring other services to the last mile, leveraging the microfinance platform? So I brought in healthcare solutions, mobile solutions, clean energy, and healthcare. Some worked and some didn't, which made me realize that you needed a company like Frontier Markets that could be devoted to hearing the voice of the rural consumer, designing products with them, and then delivering on a local last mile delivery platform, and recognizing that women will be a really important piece of that puzzle. So the experience of energy firsthand on the ground in those first seven years is actually what really motivated me to focus on energy access first, recognizing that if energy is services are met, it becomes a gateway or a foundation for other services to follow. And today we have a strong leadership team of over 60 years of experience in operations, distribution, microfinance, technology, and data. 
as well as 110 people working in management in the field, of which 50% are women. Frontier Markets earns revenue in three ways, through product sales, service fees for facilitation of finance, as well as R&D for product innovation. This is working with the Unilevers and Kohlers of the world to actually design products together to reach the last mile at scale. And our model has been proven for both impact and profitability. We started our work in Rajasthan with a goal to do deep scale, perfect our process before we expand it to new states. And since then, we've been leveraging minimal data inventory, localized marketing, targeting 33% conversion rates, really tracking and proving profitability. For the last three years, prior to our equity raise, we actually were operating and, uh, and running on 2x growth rates with profitability, leveraging our own money. And uh, that is what really allowed us to create a validation at scale. Last year, we raised a bridge round of investments with leading partners who then invested in our growth enabling us to develop partnerships with Indian governments to access local networks at scale, tech companies for software solutions, innovative funds for experimenting on financing models, and strategic partnerships for quality assurance and marketing campaigns. Enabling us to successfully establish our presence in four states of India with 20 NGO partnerships reaching 4,600 villages, which is essentially 4.8 million people as our captive customer base. And through our experience on the ground, we've been also able to capture insights on our rural consumers. In less than one month, we were serving half a million people to understand what is it that they need next. And we saw that there's a change in rural consumer demands. People want internet, they want access to larger appliances, they want credit services, they want education access. And we believe what's exciting is that they want us to bring it to them. And we see an opportunity to then deliver that. So we tested it. We partnered with leading mobile companies to introduce smartphones in every rural household. We then partnered with telecom and finance companies to introduce services like internet connectivity, top-ups, and phone services, and finance, facilitated by our women entrepreneurs. And then we introduced a diversified product basket. We had the advantage of insights, an established customer base, an e-commerce platform, this robust Sahili network that's trusted in the village, and this local distribution platform to really test this fast. And it's working. Frontier Markets has earned $2.5 million last year, and we're on track to achieve $6.8 million in revenue this year, with an EBITDA positive $250,000. We continue to invest in energy access as our main foundation to build trust and onboard Sahilis. But once we've done that and we have tech and information, we very easily start bringing in other products and services to really create a 2x growth in our network and our customer base. And with the e-commerce platform, we're able to control our expansion, monitor our scale, and also really bring more services to this 4 million consumer base to become the platform for rural purchasing in India. And we're already, we're ready now to accelerate that growth. 10,000 Solar Sahil, uh, Jeevan Sahilis to earn $10 million of, of, of income to impact 10 million people by 2023. We're keen on continuing to our work with leveraging product companies and service providers that are wanting to leverage our platform to bring in products and services and co-create and ideate. So R&D companies that would be interested in wanting to see what's the next big innovation for the last mile. But also with data and AI companies because we can build predictive analytics and help strengthen our consumer partnerships. This opportunity is huge. Can you imagine being able to now facilitate menstruation and healthcare for women because you have access to uh, patterns on people's period cycles and then you're able to deliver sanitary napkins without anyone knowing? Can you imagine working with a farmer to understand when they're gonna be uh, needing to grow wheat and who they're gonna be selling it to and what their patterns will be and therefore quickly finance their $100 finance requirement for payment in three months? These are the opportunities that we see that we can unfold by working with us on, our, on that platform. And so finally, to accelerate that growth uh, of products, services, and scale, we are raising a $5 million equity round to close by 20, end of 2020 to achieve $130 million in revenue by 2023. Look, we believe that investing in women is smart business, and it's the key to deliver multiple services at scale, as well as alleviate poverty. So I'd like to thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for the perfect timing, Ajayita. Uh,
I might just set the example. So I'm Loïc de Fontaubert, an investor from Rassembleur d'Energie. I have one question. I'd like you, if possible, to have the same pattern when asking questions. Ajayta, can you elaborate on how you, uh, what kind of tools you use to reassure investors that were not familiar with Indian regulations? Because it is possible, we did it, but there's a way to it. <laughs> Sure. Uh, so the, the Indian, Indian regulatory system is clearly not just a maze, but also uh, ever changing. So um, as a part of our team, we have a very strong compliance team as well as an audit team and a finance team that actually works very closely with in Indian regulatory systems to understand how to create those tools. Some of the tools that we've been using for our raise to uh, bring in foreign capital has been um, straight equity. But we've also used a convertible note, which actually has proven to be more effective because it is a pseudo debt structure, but it also allows you to create that equity, which means foreign capital can come into India without having to deal with the regulatory mismatches uh, well on the ground. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Um, have, my microfinance hat kicks in when you say that. So, um, uh, so the answer to your question is we do not need to register as an NBFC uh, for two reasons. So one is what we are doing as direct innovative financing is still linked to the products that we're actually introducing. So we're able to use tools like leasing and EMIs or credit terms that really allows us to then do the financing required. But then on direct financial services, we're partnering with companies. Um, so we're working with uh, a lot of banks, et cetera, who've all talked about digital financial inclusion and want to create products for the last mile, but haven't been able to deliver it. So I think the combination of the Sahili acting as a banking correspondent with the direct connect to the end consumer allows us to do this more effectively. Knowing the cash challenges in the last mile, the Sahili is able to collect that cash and deposit it into her wallet, which allows more transparency and customer data, which is beneficial for the finance companies. Thank you very much, Ajayta. Just uh, so you know, you can meet Ajayta later on in the afternoon. So delivering solutions to rural populations is definitely a key challenge. Alex from Systema, uh, could you please shed light on what Systema offers and tell us how you managed to build this cross-continent world champion out of waste. Well, yes, Luik, I can. Hi, I I'm Alex Eaton. I represent Sistema Bio. We are providing last mile energy solutions for small farmers. Uh, the people that are growing our food today are going hungry. The people that are managing more than 50% of humanity's arable lands are the people that are most likely to be food insecure and represent 80% of the poorest people on earth. This is not only just a massive market failure, it's a huge opportunity to make massive progress on the sustainable development goals. We believe that if we provide smallholder farmers with the technology, training, and financing they need, they will do the hard work to achieve the sustainable development goals. It won't be uh, happening out of Geneva. It'll happen in the fields. It'll happen in the countries that we're trying to serve. I grew up on a small farm. I can assure you that smallholder farmers are the hardest working people on earth, and all we need to do is empower them to do that. We dove into this question a little bit deeper and we found that waste management, access to energy, and access to agricultural inputs are the drivers of poverty, inefficiency, and those market failures. If we think about uh, enteric disease and diseases from poor indoor air quality, they're killing more people than all other things combined on Earth. All violence, all war, all other diseases, nothing comes close to the health burden that comes from poor indoor air quality and inefficient energy. Um, as well, in Mexico, 80% of all the soils are sterile. Just let that sink in quickly. 
The Green Revolution has basically decimated agriculture around the world. Mexico doesn't make any of its own fertilizers, so that means if they don't get a shipload of Russian fertilizer, 80% of that ground will not produce food. So that is the cradle of the most productive food crops on earth, and they've basically decimated their uh, sovereignty as it comes to food. So when we thought about this problem, we introduced a couple of very basic solutions. Uh, seemed logical now. It took a little bit of time to get it together. So the first thing we did was introduce a uh, uh, basically a biogas digester. Uh, we patented a system that replicated something that had existed for a very long time. It takes organic waste, turns it into natural gas. The byproduct is now a mineralized, nutrient-rich slurry that can be used for fertilizer. Uh, the natural gas can then be used for cooking, heating, and running farm appliances. And then we built a business model around that to uh, address the barriers that had uh, not allowed that technology to take off in the past. So basically, we wrapped it with a service model, so uh, all the installation, long-term service, and guarantees, and then we did all the financing in-house to eliminate the barriers to developing that and the, the barriers for farmers to make that investment. We've done that with 50,000 people in 24 countries over the last eight years, which have basically given us the data points to show that we can reach two billion people. So one in three people on Earth is a small farmer, uh, we've worked in every climate across every socioeconomic condition that you can imagine in this period of time. And so we can say now with confidence that we have access to and we know how to reach these farmers. We're doing that, uh, if you sort of think about it in very, very simple terms, one bucket of waste will allow a farmer to produce enough gas to cook for about three hours. That's about 80 to 100% of their household cooking needs. That's about equivalent to 2.1 kilowatt hours or almost a liter of gasoline, if you think about that in energy equivalents, every single day. And so now we can scale that up. The one farmer has about, one bucket is a farmer with a cow, um, one ton is a farmer with about 50 cows, and you can scale that up until about 200 cows is what our platform will serve. That same one bucket's providing about 40 square meters uh, of fertilization, and all of those energy and cost savings basically translate from anywhere from 10 to 80% of the cash payments that a smallholder farmer are making in their daily life. So essentially what we're creating is the circular economy tech platform. So allowing all of the waste and the inefficiencies that can come out of an agricultural platform to be turned into resources. We're doing it in a way that's highly scalable, very, very durable, long lasting, and that allows farmers to add a bunch of different appliances and, and services over time. What this model looks like in the field is basically local promoters. We've got about 200 spread across six countries today. They are from their village, half of them are women, and they basically are using a simple tool, the demonstration event. Uh, we've, we've mastered the, a very simple format over time, find an agricultural leader, empower him with a system, allow us to do a bunch of demonstration events at their farm, people come. It's not that intuitive that shit turns into gold, so we basically have to show people how that works, and once they know that it's not uh, voodoo or uh, some sort of false alchemy, we can basically demonstrate that, and when they see it, they're convinced. We pair that with really good service, and so we do a diagnostic, do the installation, and uh, this, these are professionals um, that are coming in, doing the installation, and doing the follow-up servicing. And then we offer, I'm missing an S up there for some reason. We offer this with a um, mall holders, this is a new type of farmer. Um, so we offer this with inclusive financing. So this basically allows farmers to invest over time. You can see basically what they've got is a series of expenses that are increasing over time. We neutralize that with a fixed payment plan while they're paying off uh, the technology. And as soon as the technology is paid off, that flips into savings for them. So the unit economics for them are very positive and provides a really positive ROI over time. This all sits on top of a mobile data platform, so we're able to collect all this data in real time in, at the farm, track their experience over time, and make sure that we have a database of farmers so that we can work with them over the long term. And we do that because our, farm, our team is mostly made up of farmers themselves. So we recruit from the local villages that we're working in. We're about 200 full-time staff uh, all around the world, and then about twice that in independent promoters and technicians. Our business model 
uh, you can see a little bit of the trajectory. What we did was start with a technological proof of concept, built out our systems in central Mexico, began to expand, and that's the process that we're in now. So currently we uh, have offices in Mexico, Nicaragua, Colombia, Kenya, and India, and we're serving East Africa, um, about half of the Indian states, and, and most of Latin America from those hubs through independent promoters. The unit economics of the product, um, so our average product size is uh, at about $1,200, um, right in there. Our, the smallest system is about half that, ex that cost and the largest system is about five times that. And you can see the margins across our, our both product delivery and uh, the unit economics of implementing that with the farmer over time. And the, the bottom graph shows we're, we're quite a bit more profitable in our largest systems, so we call those our productive scale farmers. And so we've been trending towards increasing, improving that product mix over time. We're still serving 55% uh, of the people are still sort of below the global poverty line, but we're increasing that mix to make sure that we have a profitable, a more profitable mix over time. So what we're trying to do now is we've built out a network that will allow us to reach about 100 million farms. And what we want to do to uh, basically be able to reach those farms at a faster pace, we're improving our manufacturing capacity, lowering our COGS, we're increasing our partnerships, we're exploring a bunch of uh, results-based financing. So we just signed a deal uh, for carbon credit offtake, and we're participating in a couple uh, uh, social development bonds, and we're also reducing our customer acquisition costs and improving the customer lifetime value. That happens in two ways. So the first thing is our normal package is basically a cooking, uh, cooking appliances for the farmers. We can then add machinery, electrical generation, milking machines, and other productive uh, water pumps and things like that. And then we can, over time, help them expand their farm add irrigation and, and add water storage and a couple other things. All of these things we can track on ROI and basically build them into our payment platform. The other way that we're adding uh, customer lifetime values through services. So you can see these are our systems installed in Kenya. Um, and if we zoom into one of these clusters, you can see we've got thousands of farmers that we can now serve with uh, services. Uh, we can sell fertilizer to their neighbors. We can sell energy. And we're actually taking large farms and using them to sell gas to their neighbors through biogas pipelines, through gas compression. And um, so this allows us to basically create a circular economy ecosystem that we can build on over time. What we're trying to do now is raise about $30 million to increase uh, this trajectory over time. What we're going to do is expand our sales network, expand our B2B partnerships for other geographies, and uh, basically use the working capital to, uh, to, to keep the machine running, basically. So since we're financing this, we've got about a 12-month uh, capital hold time that we need in terms of manufacturing and delivery. So uh, a lot of our investors are sitting in this room. Uh, full disclosure, Luik is one of them. Uh, also FM, FMO and Alpha Mundi, uh, Triodas Bank, and others that are here. Um, we've, we've gotten here through partnerships and through a lot of support. Um, it's, we've, we've grown incrementally and slowly through this uh, basically support and recognition. Some of these are our finance partners, some of these are our clients, uh, and some of these are recognitions that we've won, but it's basically been, it's been a long journey to get here, but I can say now uh, with very little doubt that smallholder farmers are gonna be the ones that help us achieve the majority of these SDGs, and social and sustainable businesses can help us achieve those. So uh, I'm Alex, this is Sistema Bio, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, Alex, though I, I regularly get the occasion to see you, can you get into uh, the details of what your needs will be? Because given your geographic exposure, the various types of need, equity, debt, because uh, you may disclose that you've raised money at different levels, uh, can you get into what kind of uh, financing you would need and where that could be? Yeah, so the majority of our... Uh, needs is working capital, so um, through through debt and convertible convertible vehicles. So that's where the majority of this expansion will come from. We'd like to also explore a little bit more equity to continue to build up the team, 
build out the partnerships that we have around the world. So part of our uh, plan for expansion is through B2B partnerships that we've already proven in, in other countries. Um, and we, I mean, to be frank, we also believe that there's a huge area of results-based financing that we still have yet to explore. So the SDGs uh, probably won't all be solved through 100% market-based. There's just people that are too poor to make investments. And so we'd like to be able to dig deeper into the base of the pyramid through working uh, both through carbon credits and, and other impact funding. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, sustainable mobility is also a key concern in emerging economies. Voluntary green policies are sometimes put in place earlier than in old markets. Rosemary, can you tell us how Three Wheels United fits into this landscape? What would you choose? Door number one, let your family starve. Door number two, pollute the earth and make just enough to feed them. If this is your only option, there's not really a question, is it? I'm Rosemary Pierce Messick with Three Wheels United. We are door number three. We're disrupting lending in India on our way to becoming the leading financier for light electric mobility in the global south. This is Kumar. He is an auto rickshaw driver or a tuk-tuk driver in India. He's been driving a vehicle for the past 10 years, supporting his family of four. He, pollutes, he, he, he rents a polluted vehicle daily, which means he earns half his income potential, maxing out at about $8 a day. And this vehicle will contribute to about 65 tons of CO2 over its life. Last year, Kumar decided he wanted to own his own vehicle. So he approached an NBFC, a non-banking financial company, to purchase one, or to receive a loan to purchase one. They offered a loan that covered 70% of the cost of the vehicle, but the remaining down payment was too high for him to cover. So he approached a money lender. This money lender offered him a loan at 60% interest rate. Within a matter of months, he defaulted on both of these loans, returning to renting a vehicle, forcing him to choose door number two. Unfortunately, Kumar's story is not unique. There are more than 6 million of these vehicles in India, operated by over 12 million drivers, of which over half rent their vehicle daily. This is an electric auto rickshaw or tuk-tuk, a full-sized, full-speed vehicle. It has a lower total cost of ownership and is more profitable than a fuel-operated one. It has zero direct carbon emissions, and the Indian government is offering benefits and subsidies for purchasing one. So it seems like the perfect solution for helping drivers like Kumar earn more money and for reducing pollution. Well, it is, but these vehicles have a higher upfront cost, which means this down payment is even larger, and it requires some change in operational habits. For example, charging instead of fueling, adding some level of hesitation for taking one up. So without the financing that actually works for these vehicles and for these drivers, they're not being purchased. So at Three Wheels United, we're offering a holistic solution for purchasing a light electric vehicle such as a tuk-tuk. We're combining tailored financing solutions with innovative technology that allows us to offer a competitive loan, de-risking our lending, and removing barriers for uptake. The result? A triple bottom line impact, reducing pollution and poverty in a highly scalable and profitable business model. We use innovative structured finance and credit enhancers designed specifically for mobility assets to offer a loan that covers up to 100% of the cost of the vehicle at a low interest rate. We're also partnering with local manufacturers to offer extended warranties, downtime guarantees, and accessible charging across the cities to remove the hesitation around operating an electric vehicle. And we're working with large fleet operators and ride hailing platforms to offer an income guarantee to ensure these drivers have enough money to take home to their families and to pay their loans. And we're working with uh, manufacturers and foundations to buy back polluted vehicles, which are then scrapped and recycled, 
ensuring we're actually replacing polluted vehicles with less polluted ones. The result, Three Wheels United is a one-stop shop for vehicle renters and owners alike to come to us, leave with an electric vehicle, and the guarantee that they will be better off tomorrow. Now, offering this holistic, tailored solution for purchasing an electric vehicle is great, but at the end of the day, we are a financier, which means we need to effectively collect the loans that we issue. So we've developed data-driven technology that, allows us, that combines loan management and asset management, keeping our operations costs and our default rates low, and improving driver income. We're partnered with Microsoft Research in developing this, and we've been working with the auto rickshaw market for the past 10 years. Through this, we've developed innovative loan management that allows us to scale proven microfinance principles in a way that still works for this market, maintaining the critical human elements required in this demographic. We use various touch points to collect behavioral data, which allows us to make informed decisions on loan management. This means one of our loan agents that previously could have managed 30 loans can now manage 100 or more. We leverage on peer pressure using social games and digitizing the self-help group model that we all know so well. Through this, we have maintained our default rates below 1% compared to 30% seen in this market. And we use data from the vehicles to improve the profitability and the longevity of the vehicles and their batteries. All this information is provided to a driver in an easy to use mobile application, allowing them to manage their vehicles and their loan in one place. And our backend is con constantly collecting and analyzing this data to create this system. To date, we have offered over 30,000 drivers various products and services, and we have financed 2,500 vehicles to date. This means we have generated over $90 million of extra income for drivers and reduced CO2 by 28,000 tons. We're sitting at an interesting intersection of financial inclusion, fintech, mobility, and clean energy. And because of our innovation in this, we've received various awards across these sectors. And we've been endorsed by the Climate Policy Initiative as one of the world's most innovative models for climate finance in the global south. We are an effective management team with combined over 50 years experience in technology, finance, and mobility. We're supported by a team of highly, 25 highly qualified and passionate local individuals on the ground in India. And we're backed by a board comprised of CEOs and founders in highly successful companies in technology and finance. So now that we have our proven model and technology in place, as well as our strong team and partnerships, we're ready to quickly scale this. So we are working with large fleet operators and ride-hailing platforms to expand our reach and to also begin financing electric two-wheelers. Through directly financing directly to clients as well as through these operators, we plan to finance 10,000 vehicles in the next one year and 100,000 in the next four. This will generate over $6 billion of extra income for these drivers and reduce CO2 by 6.5 million tons. And going beyond impact, we are projecting an ROE of 20 to 30 percent. This year we're closing a 1.8 million dollar equity round to strengthen our capital base. Our current investors include the European Union, Google Impact, Gardena Risk Management, Techstars, South British Capital, and Microsoft. And now that we're ready to quickly scale this, we need to ensure we have the backing of DFIs and large institutional investors to ensure the funding is available at scale. So following this round, we're opening up another of six million in equity and 82 million in debt. And we're also continuing to seek concessionary funds and instruments to improve our scalability and our profitability. So I'm going to ask you one more question. What would you choose? Door number one, have a big impact. Door number two, make a lot of money. Again, we are Three Wheels United. We're door number three. Thank you.
Yeah. So uh, before you have any additional questions, I have one, uh, Rosemary. Uh, first, congratulations, and uh, mainly on the low default rate. <laughs> uh, we seldom see this in the uh, uh, off-grid uh, electrification industry. <laughs> Uh, what kind of skill, soft skills would you need from your uh, investors, from your board moving forward? Yeah, like uh, what, what, what on top of just financing could you, could, would you like to get from your future investors? I think I mentioned that we're at an interesting intersection and what I mean by that is we're, we're, we're working with electric mobility and if you think about that, you can think about, okay, what happens with charging? What happens with um, the other vehicles? And you, all these questions are raised. And then you say, okay, but you're a, a licensed finance company in India. Okay, so this raises questions of how you're managing your, your default rates and how you're actually getting your money and, and all of these questions. Um, I think anyone that kind of is across the spread of a variety of, of sectors would be beneficial. I think we need to, um, I mean, we have various expertise already, I think we can continue to grow on that. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic presentation. Um, just a quick question about your view on the other initiatives underway currently in India. Um, not specifically on the nature of the vehicle, but on the 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 jug new models like the the rickshaw ride sharing, the Uber meets the rich rickshaw kind of model. Are you working with some of those other companies in the country already? Absolutely, yeah. So I mentioned the income guarantees. Um, so we are working with these partners in a few ways. So they are um, we encourage our drivers to be on these platforms. Not only can we ensure they're making more money, we can actually ensure we're getting the income, collecting the loans right from the source. So we are working with these, and then they can also offer us uh, an extended reach for, for new clients. So they offer us um, large databases, which we can then go through and find new clients. So absolutely, we are definitely doing that. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Uh, now, uh, maybe uh, if uh, Lisa could come and tell us uh, what kind of solution she's uh, offering to uh, rural populations. Uh, it fits right at the, at the right moment after what we've heard from Alex. And uh, I think it would be great to have you all. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Smits. I run Ignitia. We do tropical weather forecast for small-scale farmers in West Africa. Let me see if I have a clicker. There we go. So we discovered uh, some time ago that over the tropical belt, which is here marked in green, we didn't have fairly reliable weather forecast. This is mainly to do with that the kind of models that today predict most of the weather forecasts that you see on your phone or at the TV station are actually produced by three global models. Two of them are in Europe and one is in US. The models have not had as their mission to make first and foremost weather forecasts for the tropics, but for middle latitudes such as here, and have succeeded with that pretty well. However, we see that there is a big gap here and Knowing that there are four billion people living in this belt, this is something that we need to work on. I should say from a small-scale farmer perspective as well, each decision that a farmer makes is based on weather. So in order to time these decisions well, um, farmers need to um, know what is going to happen. And uh, because of that, we also think that they can increase their yields because a large percent of the yield loss that happens today is, is due to, you know, badly timed decisions. So I will show you what is the difference between our weather forecast and other weather forecasts. So you can see here on the left-hand side, BBC's uh, weather forecast. It's for an area of West Africa. I show you the same map here in the background. And what this one says is basically that it's going to rain all over the place, 48 hours ahead of time. 
We are saying that it's going to rain in two spots and a little bit along the coast. What really happened, we can see in a satellite picture here, it did rain in two spots and a little bit along the coast. Not a perfect forecast, but fairly enough, you know, much, much closer to what actually happened. We have been able to increase the accuracy from existing 39% in tropical areas to 84%. This is something that we have validated with third-party studies by universities as well. So how does this help the farmer? Well, back to the timing decisions. So when the farmer is about to plant, he wants to know that it's going to rain, because otherwise the seeds won't germinate. Moving on to the largest investment every year for a small-scale farmer is the fertilizer. And Applying the fertilizer and then having a really heavy rain just a few hours after will just wash away the fertilizer and it will end up in the ditch instead of being ingested by the plant. And so it moves on until harvesting time, labor planning, as well as just packaging and selling it. And these are 12 steps that we think that we can help out with. We have one of our customers here. His name is Muhammad. He lives on um, almost $2 per day when we met him. And we provided a service to him to see like, how could this work for him and what kind of decisions could he, could he do better. It turns out that he was the only one in the village that got a harvest that year because the planting was wrongly timed. A dry spell came in, which meant that nothing germinated. And he discovered that he could plant after the dry spell because we let him know about that. Also, he managed to get his fertilizer application right, he used the spraying at the right time, and he could also gather his family to help him at the right time to harvest the crops. We run today with two different business models. On the B2B side, we work with um, farmer organizations. We also work with FMCGs um, with their supply chain and we work with input providers. These could be like a fertilizer company or a, a chemical company that supply the weather forecast. Uh, they bundle it with their own product. So basically you get two by one and they get a competitive advantage. What I will now tell you more about is our B2C product. So small scale farmers in West Africa, they generally don't know um, much about high tech at all, I should start with saying, but, but uh, they're often also illiterate. Um, this means that we need to develop a system where they could recognize words rather than just, um, rather than uh, reading them, and by that understand, you know, what the forecast is gonna be. So if the first sentence said the word rain, they would know that it would rain the same day. If the second sentence said the word dry, well, then it would be dry tomorrow. This way, we have managed to know that a majority of our farmers recognizes after 150 days, so one season, uh, all of our seven keywords. The system is pretty smart because we go and partner with telecommunication operators uh, where farmers can sign up themselves to the service by using a short code on their mobile phone. Uh, by this, we can also charge them automatically from their preloaded airtime, so balance on the phone. And uh, we can, on a daily basis, provide them with a subscription service of a weather forecast. So, how has it gone? Well, we started in 2015 with this business model. Since then, it's been a number of rainy seasons that has gone by, and that's why we have days of active service as as the uh, X line here. Uh, we are today on 1.1 million farmers that are both paying for the weather forecast as well as they have subscribed themselves to it. It costs about four cents per day, measured in dollars, to uh, get the service from us. We have leveraged this beyond Ghana, now also to Burkina Faso, to Mali, to Nigeria, to Ivory Coast, and we will launch a little bit later this year in Cameroon. Now something got stuck. There we go. So, the impact. Let me see. There we go. 
from the $6 that the farmer would pay in the season, we would know that um, he gets his investment back about 80 times by using our service. That's kind of a good return on investment, we believe. Um, usually, or our average farmer makes a little bit more than $2 per day. This means that this farmer moves into a new category of income level of $3.1 per day. It might not sound like a huge increase, but for these farmers it truly is because they can start then investing in their own agriculture as well as send their kids to school because they're no longer needed on the field. For different crops is of course different yield increases, um, but on average over all crops that we have been measuring, uh, it's a 65% increase in yields. The study was done by a researcher from UC Berkeley that came and spent six months out in the bush interviewing farmers. And this is how we got these results. The market in the tropics is really big. There are about 500 million small-scale farmers out there. So we would like to continue to expand this beyond Africa and start to look at the Latin American market as well. The way we do our forecast is that we collect a lot of raw data, then we put it into our model, which is then doing the actual weather prediction. This is run on our supercomputer that is based today in Stockholm underground. And this is then early in the morning sent down to the countries of where we are operating, where a meteorologist will have a little look at it before it is sent out to the end user. Basically, this whole chain uh, happens within two hours, which means that we can really provide like near-time data for them, and um, so they get the latest possible then. We've gotten some industry recognition. One that I wanted to mention for you was the Google Moonshot. You might know that Google has uh, its own moonshot, such as the Project Loon, the self-driving car. Um, they did once ever a um, recognition of companies that were outside of their investments of moonshots. 36 companies got this. We were one of them. My management team is with Rui, that is an experienced uh, telecom operator guy. He um, has been working on developing markets for uh, the last 20 years. Um, Deep Tea, that is running operations and staff today, is based in Ghana and is running our West African operations, also very seasoned in driving this. Yeah, our competitive advantage, uh, if it hasn't been clear until now, is basically that we have a proven scientific accuracy. We are a, a bottom of the pyramid centric product and this is created for the tropics. Lastly, I just want to show you some financials. Um, this year we're going to make 2.3 million dollars. Uh, next year we hope to double it. What we are looking for in investment is a five million dollar uh, in equity. We have a track record of previously raising about two million dollars. Our investors come from Silicon Valley, um, Hack VC, you might have heard of them. Um, then also we have a few uh, that you might also have heard of, like Finca, it's a big microfinance institute that is present in 80 countries today, and a few others. What we are hoping for is to do a replication of our model into Brazil. This is going to be more of a B2B market solution rather than the B2C one, which we hope to continue to scale in West Africa. Thank you very much for listening. So I think this is a very good presentation. We want to commend you for the good work. Um, coming from West Africa, I recognize how a technology like this could be useful to our farmers. What I'm wondering though, is that this seems to be very heavy on prediction. 
uh, forecasting. But you were right when you said that farmers depend, about 96% or so depend on rains for the agriculture. But this technology or innovation is only able to forecast whether there will be rains today or tomorrow. And the farmer may decide to plant based on the forecast, accurate though it is. But what happens the following week is not dependent on the app. So I'm trying to figure out the, the link between the forecasting and the productivity of the farmer in terms of the farmer planting and getting rains to support the crops that have been planted. I don't know if you get it. I think I got your question. Is this on? No. I think I got your question, thank you. Um, what I didn't mention, uh, just due to time, is that we also provide them with a seasonal outlook that will tell them, you know, if it's going to be drier or wetter than a normal season, month by month. These are the kind of decisions a farmer needs at the planting stage. All the other decision-making points up until harvesting and packaging are dependent on a 48-hour weather forecast. So, good point. Are you? I'm Paolo, an impact investor. Um, since you're looking for equity capital, I'm very curious, what could be the exit opportunities for a business like this one? That's a really good question as well. Um, so the exit opportunities, as I see it, might come from two different ends. One is the agricultural end, where agricultural companies see the value in order to enhance their own product and competitive advantage. The other one is typical tech companies. Um, we have already gotten a few offers, uh, but have decided to continue to run this for a few more years. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. To thank one more time all the entrepreneurs and our great moderator Loïc. We are about to start the panel, so please stay in the room. Thank you very much.